morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning, and we welcome you in the Lord's name, and we trust that we'll know the blessing of the Lord as we meet together. Let me just give you one or two announcements in the will of the Lord for the incoming week. You'll remember the Lord's table is spread before us this morning. This is the Lord's table for the Lord's people. If you're saved and you're walking in fellowship with the Lord, then we bid you welcome to join with us as we remember the Lord uh, in his own appointed way. You remember our gospel meeting at 7 o'clock this evening in the church building, uh, preceded with half an hour of prayer at 6.30. So remember the gospel meeting this evening at 7 o'clock in the church building. Wednesday at 7.30 is our prayer and Bible study. And that brings us to next Lord's Day, uh, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock in the morning, and then Sunday evening at 7 o'clock in the evening. And we commit all those uh, announcements to the Lord and in His will in the week that lies ahead. Let me just give you one other announcement. North Coast Drive-In Special. Uh, the Faith Mission are having a, a drive-in special at the Paddock site, uh, the Northwest Park Paddock site just between Port Rush and Port Stewart from the 5th to the 9th of July. And there's different speakers and singers every night. So please, there's wee leaflets out in the foyer. You can pick one of those up as you go out this morning. I think that's all the announcements. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing number 638. 638, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word.
Now let's just still our hearts in the presence of God this morning and seek his face. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, with hearts that are bowed in awe and wonder in thy most holy presence, we draw aside to thee in that name that is above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to thee, our Father, in our weakness, in our frailty. We come to thee, our Father, God, willingly confessing that without thee, we can do nothing. But Father, we thank thee and we praise thee that with Christ, we are more than conquerors. Father, with Christ, all things are possible. And so our Father, in awe and wonder and yet with great confidence, we bow in thy presence. For is there anything too hard for thee? We come to thee, our Father God, this morning to thank thee and praise thee that so many who are here this morning are saved and know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and our Lord. Father, we thank thee for the day and hour that we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee and we praise thee, our Father, our sins, which were so many and so vile and so damning and condemning to our souls have been cast away as far as the east is from the west. Father, we thank thee and we praise thee that you have chosen in your grace and in your mercy never to remember them against us again. We thank thee, our Father, that the Lord Jesus Christ could say, him who the Son sets free is free indeed. And we come to praise thee and we come to thank thee and we pray, our Father God, that in the might and the power and in the liberty of the Holy Spirit, we would worship and adore thee this morning. Father, if there's some gathered in this morning or watching through our uh, YouTube channel, we pray if they're not saved, that you'll save them. Father, we realize that we are drawing to the end of the age. The door of grace, we believe, is beginning to close. We believe our Father God that the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ is at hand. And Father, it's time. It's time for we thy people to work while it is day. And so Father, we ask of thee reverently. And yet our Father with every force within our heart and soul. If there are men and women today coming under the sound of the gospel wherever it may be. We pray that thou would save. Bring many more souls into the kingdom of God. Father, we think of our nation today. We look at the laws that are being passed. We look at society and the breakup of the home and the breakup of the family. We see our young people, our Father, uh, unable to even make up their mind who they are or what life's about. Confusion reigns. Heartache seems to be everywhere. Loneliness seems to abound. But oh, our Father God, we thank thee. That into the lives of each and every one, there is a friend who will stick closer than a brother. There is a friend who says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. There is one, our Father, who has promised to lead us into all truth. And lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so our Father, today we pray for our nation. That our nation, our society, might turn our eyes to thee again might lay hold upon thee and seek thy forgiveness and know the healing of our land. But oh, Father God, for these moments that we spend with thee this morning, let them be sweet. Draw us ever closer to thee. Let the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of thy glory and in the light of thy grace. Let us, our Father God, with one heart and one soul lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so our Father, we rest in thee this morning. We seek thy blessing as we turn to thy word. As we rest our hearts around the table of remembrance. We pray our Father God that thou would be in our midst. And that to bless us. For we ask it in Jesus' precious and lovely name. Amen. Amen. Now folks, if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. If you're visiting with us this morning, we give you a warm word of welcome. We're glad to see you. Thank you for coming. And we trust that you'll know the blessing of the Lord as you meet with the fellowship here at Port Rush Baptist. But if you're visiting with us, we're going through the book of Acts at the moment. 
And we're looking at the boldness of the New Testament church. And we're asking the question, is that same boldness in the church of Jesus Christ today? Are we a, a good representation of that New Testament church that was empowered, invigorated by God the Holy Ghost and turned the world upside down? And uh, we've been looking at that over these last number of weeks. But we're going to chapter 4. We're not going to get chapter 4 done today. We're just going to look at the first 10 verses of Acts chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through to verse 10. Let's hear the word of God together. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day. For it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priests and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Amen. And we know that God again will bless the public reading of his own inspired, precious, holy, infallible word. When I read that portion of scripture and read the chapter and, and began to look at it, some thoughts formulated in my mind. You might think it's kind of weird, but you'll get used to that. But I, th I thought to myself, what was the first thing I gave to my children when they were born? What was the first thing? I was there when the three of them were born. Uh, the oldest one has just turned 34. Now, I was a teenager when I got born. <laughs> I wish. But what was the first thing? And maybe you could sit there and think to yourself, well, what was the first thing I gave to my son or my daughter when they were born? Was it a hug? Was it a kiss? Was it a dummy to keep them quiet? <laughs> Was it a teddy bear? Was it a cot? What did you give? What was the first thing you gave your child when they were born? Let me tell you the first thing you gave your child. The first thing you gave your child when that child was born was your name. <coughs> That's what you gave them. They are your child. They are part of your family. And the first thing you and I give to our children was our name. That name that had been handed down to us from, from generation to generation. Uh, the name that identified us as, as a child of our family and a child to, to our father and to our mother. And also, it's a name that that assured us of our parents' love and their care and their devotion throughout our life. A name that we hoped and uh, uh, they hoped and prayed that we would honor as we grew older. And that's the first thing we gave to our children was a name. A name that they, we hoped that they would, they would hold on to, that they would love and that they would honor and not bring disgrace to as they would grow up. I remember my father saying to me, Never forget, he said to all of us, never forget who you are. Never forget the family that you've come from. Never forget your name. And so names are important. Some become famous for all different reasons. Churchill, Gandhi, Trump, Windsor. Some carry great power. Some engender admiration. Others 
to stain. For you and me, when we get saved, when we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord, we became God's child. And we have taken to ourselves a name, Christian, or Christ's ones. And we are Christians, and that name Christian identifies us as belonging to God. As those who have given their heart and soul and life and eternity into the hands of Almighty God and have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the verse says there in verse 12 in chapter 4. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Friends, when we come into chapter 4 of the book of Acts, we're meeting a name that's above every name. We are coming face to face with a name that's above every name, a name upon which rests the eternal destiny of every single soul. The name of one who has influenced the world more than anyone has ever influenced the world. A name, when we think about it, and we examine that name, and we look at that name, and we examine the character of that name, we find it is a name that offers mercy, and love, and grace, and forgiveness, and cleansing for the whosoever will. And yet, there is no other name in the world today more rejected and more despised than this name. And what is that name? Well Peter reveals it to us in verse 10. It says be it known unto you. And to all the people of Israel. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Whom ye crucified. Whom God raised from the dead. Even by him doth this man stand before you. Oh. This morning. As we go into chapter 4. We're going to begin to look at, and we won't finish it this week, maybe in a couple or three weeks we'll maybe get through this chapter. But we're looking at this chapter under the title of the boldness of his name. The boldness of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll remember in our last study we examined the healing of the man who was lame from birth. A moment of divine intervention. A miracle of omnipotent power. And where was the power and the authority of this miracle granted? Was it, did it rest in these two men, Peter and John? No. Why it says there in verse 6 of X chapter 3, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Beloved, the power and authority that resides in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, as the people of God, we are to walk in the paths of righteousness because of his name. We are to come together and gather as God's people in his name. We are to endure suffering and persecution for his name. We are to bow our knees and lift up our hearts to a holy God in his name. And we are to serve, serve in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to rebuke the devil and he will flee from us. As I said, I can't, I can't do justice to this, this chapter in the time we have, even over three or four weeks. But I want to start this morning by leaving with you the first of four truths concerning the name of Jesus. As we find them in Acts chapter 4. First of all, I want you to see, we're looking at this this morning. We're going to look at the strength of the name of Jesus. There is great power. There is great authority. There's great strength in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read that in verses 1 through to 10. And we'll be looking at the verses as we go along. But there's three things here that evidence for us. The strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. The strength that's in his name. First of all, there is the evidence of the resurrection. In verses 1 to 3, but a certain, sorry, let me go back to chapter 4 and chapter 5 there. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them. 
being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold on to the next day, for it was now even. The first evidence of the strength of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is in the resurrection. We think that what we are seeing today on our streets, in the streets of Britain, what we're seeing today where open air preachers are being arrested by the authorities. And we think it's a new thing. Well, I want to tell you it's not a new thing. It happened to Peter and John here in chapter 4. It says, for while Peter and John were preaching Christ, the risen Savior, the temple police, the force. And they were the, 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 the authority over the, the temple area. And the priests and the Sadducees came to put a stop to the preaching. Now it says at the end of verse 1 that they came upon them. Now the idea in the Greek is that they, they stopped and seized Peter and John suddenly. They came upon them without warning. And they just seized them and they carried them away. Well, what was the charge held against Peter and John? That they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Can I say to you this morning, beloved, that wherever and whenever the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is being preached, the powers of darkness will be arrayed against it. Always. And the old Sadducees, you see, didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in life after death. And these boys were the ruling officials of the time, the religious leaders of their day. I tell you, nothing new under the sun. We have many today on pulpits and platforms who are denying the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Denying even the deity of Christ. But here's Peter and John. And they're preaching the gospel. That included the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that through the resurrection of the Lord who was the first fruit. This promise has been passed on to all who would believe in him. The promise of eternal life. And this is why they were led away. And they were held to the next day. And what the authorities were saying to Peter and John was this. We have the power. We have the authority. It's us who allows you to preach. And if we want, we'll just step in and shut you down. Can we not hear the echoes of that same threat today? Can we not? With the laws that are being passed. If you preach the gospel, we'll be after you. Even if you pray that men and women get saved, we will persecute you. Preachers got up and preached the gospel that men and women need to change. They need to trust Christ. They need to repent of their sin. That if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things become new. We will come and we will prosecute you for doing that. And those are the laws that are seeking to be passed today in our land. But what does Matthew Henry say? I read this in Matthew Henry and and I thought it was wonderful. He says this about Peter and John. They meddled not with the matters of state. But kept to their business. And preached to the people heaven as their end. And Christ as their way. I want to tell you dear friends. You cannot preach the gospel and leave out the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3 verses 9 and 10 says this. Paul says, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. When you're preaching the gospel, you're not preaching the gospel about someone who is dead and in a tomb. You're not. You're preaching the gospel of a living Savior, a risen Savior, a Redeemer that's alive today in the power of an endless life and meets men and women at the very point of their need in the wretchedness of their sin and saves them. When you're preaching the gospel, you're preaching Jesus. And governments and authorities don't understand that today. Well, of the strength that is in the name of Jesus through the resurrection 
that the bearer of this name is alive and alive forevermore and gives eternal life to all who trust in him. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. I tell you, there is no other doctrine I believe so hated by the devil than the doctrine of the resurrection. He has sought to deny it. He has sought to uh, ridicule it. He has sought to explain it away. But I want to tell you, listen, I've said it before. I hope the devil's listening in this morning. He can't vanquish it. You can't vanquish the resurrection. Because I tell you, beloved, without the resurrection, there is no gospel to preach. The resurrection is as fundamental to the gospel as Calvary is. And if you take Calvary out of the gospel, you have nothing. If you take the resurrection out of the gospel, you have nothing. You've just got a good man in a tomb. That's all you have. Beloved, the strength of the name of Jesus hinges on the resurrection. That the one who bears his name has risen from the dead and lives in the power of an endless life. And, and being so raised from the dead, he gives on to those who trust in him that everlasting life. But there's something else. There's the evidence of redemption. Not only the, re the evidence of resurrection, but there's the evidence of redemption. It says there in verse 4, how be it? Many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. In chapter 3, we, we read of, of 3,000 souls getting saved. That's tremendous. My, have we, have we had something like that happen here? Huh? If something like that, have we had one soul saved here? We would be doing somersaults. We would. But imagine being a meeting where such a crowd of people, one sea of men and women, Full of religion. Full of self-righteousness. Coming under the sound of the gospel. And 3,000 men and women. Bowing the knee. And crying unto God for salvation. What would it be like? I, I want to tell you. I think it would even put a smile on some of your faces. I think it would. 3,000 souls saved. But if that wasn't enough. Another 5,000 men. Out of two. That's not talking about the youngsters. It's not talking about the woman. 5,000 men added to it. Eh? My wife would love to see more men getting saved. I would. We need men today born again of the Spirit of God and washed in the precious blood of the Lamb. We do. But oh, there's a great evidence of redemption. 5,000 souls redeemed and saved. Through the preaching of the gospel. <coughs> Never forget beloved. That the gates of hell. While they might be raised against the gospel today. Cannot prevail against the gospel. And if they gather up every preacher. And every pastor in the world. And put us all in jail. It cannot prevent God from prevailing. It can't. Because the preaching of the gospel's power. Is not in might or strength. It's not, doesn't rest upon me and my ability to be on this pulpit. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And the gospel will always find a way because the gospel, listen, I want you to take this the right way because we talk about the gospel message and I understand that. But the gospel at its heart, at its foundation is Jesus Christ. It's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And tell me, who is there that can contain Jesus? The very heavens can't hold him. And I tell you, the courts in the world can do what they want today. They can threaten all they want. They can shut away the preachers. But they'll never shut away the gospel. Never. Beloved, if you read church history, and I have to tell you, I did church history when I was at Bible college, and I was no great fan of it. I found it heavy going. But this one thing I discovered when I was reading church history. And it's attested to. That whenever the church of Jesus Christ suffered. It grew. It grew. And I tell you this beloved. If, if a time of God sees fit to allow 
the believers here in Northern Ireland to go through a time of persecution, there'll be nobody pretending to be Christians. Sure they won't, you'll get the real thing. Be the real McCoy, you'll be getting. Oh, despite the opposition of the authorities against the gospel, against the preachers of the gospel, 5,000 souls get saved. Tell me, dear child of God, where are you and I prepared to stand today before God to see 5,000 souls saved? These two men, Peter and John, were prepared to stand between, before the same authorities that had taken their Savior, and their Master and their Lord, and had falsely accused him, had taken him and handed him over to the brutality of the Roman soldiers who marred him more than any man had ever been marred, who had left his back like a ploughed field, who spat upon him and beat him with a reed and mocked him. And then took him to the place called Calvary and spread him out across the beam and nailed his hands and feet to the cross and lifted him up there to die. A spectacle, a shameful spectacle to the mocking of the Christ. It was these same authorities that these two boys were brought before. Tell me, where are you and I prepared to stand? To see the souls of men and women see him. Where do you stand on the name of Jesus today? I tell you, we, we need to stop playing around. We need to stop thinking, well, you know, all we need to do as a church is have coffee mornings and have, have trips here and trips there and trips somewhere else. That's all right, nothing wrong with that. But I want to tell you, it's nearly all we do today. We need to be in fire for God. Souls are perishing. Men and women are going to hell. And we're not standing where we should be standing today. We need to be standing between men and women going to a lost Christless hell. And tell them of Jesus the mighty to see him. We need to stand on the name of Jesus. You see it's not the power of the preacher that saves souls. Look at chapter 3 and verse 38. It says then Peter said unto them. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You see, beloved, the power by which any soul is saved is in the name of Jesus. Souls are not saved because of preachers. Souls are not saved because of slick oratory. Souls are not saved because the preacher is a comedian or is a light entertainer to the congregation. We need Preachers today and preaching today that is founded on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, when the people heard the word, they were saved. And the word that Jesus Christ, the word was this, that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. That he died an atoning death and he was risen from the tomb victorious and alive. That was the message that they heard. And they were saved. Beloved, the strength of the name of Jesus is seen clearly in the evidence of the resurrection. And it's seen in the evidence of redemption. I believe with all my heart and with all my soul, and you can disagree with me and you can be offended with me if you wish, that's all right. I have no problem with that. But I believe the lack of souls getting saved and a great work of God been done amongst the unsaved men and women is because you and I no longer believe in the name of Jesus. We've muddied the waters and we pay lip service to it. But I want to tell you, if you and I truly believed in the power of Jesus' name, we would go on our hands and knees through Port Rush, begging people to get saved. We what? But we don't. We don't weep. And we don't mourn. 
want to tell you, if you want to prove Jesus, witness for him. Witness for him. Tell others about Jesus, the mighty to see him. Or the evidence of the resurrection, the evidence of redemption. But the third evidence of the strength of Jesus' name was the evidence of recognition. In 5 through to 10, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power and by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. I've already alluded to the scene that stood before Peter and John. The great power that was arrayed against them. The intimidation and the threat that flowed from Caiaphas and, and from Annas and, and from all the rest that were there. These were the same boys who had crucified the Lord. They were the same boys who said, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. And now their eyes are firmly fixed on Peter and John. Would you have liked to have been there? Would you have given a lot for your survival in that courtroom that day? And I think that these boys wanted Peter and John to think that they could do the same to them. We want you to know who's in charge. And the night hours only provided them with time to formulate their plan. And they could see the danger of this kind of preaching. And they wanted to know by whose power and by whose name this was done. You see, for the Jew, in Jewish thinking, the power lay in the name. Because the name spoke of the character. It spoke of the person. And that's why they said, by whose name and by what power have you done this? Listen to the strength of Jesus' name in the evidence of recognition in verses 8 through 10. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you. Oh. Do you see, first of all, the power realized in the name of Jesus? It says then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Can you see, as I've said before, the filling of the Holy Ghost wasn't just a one-time event. Here's Peter again after Pentecost standing before this tribunal and he's filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'll tell you again, I've said it and I'll say it again. Preachers and preaching needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It needs to be filled with Holy Ghost power. That is where the boldness and the ability is born. It is not born in Bible college. It is not born with degrees. It is born by the filling of the Holy Ghost. It is born by a reliance and total surrender in the name and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where it comes from, folks. And I believe that the filling of the Holy Ghost is what God has for you and for me, all of his redeemed. Power released in the name of Jesus. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. We need that today. And we can go out and have good meetings and say we've had great meetings and this, that and the other thing. But nothing's happening, folks. Nothing's moving. And we need today a move of God, the Holy Ghost, in our services. But second, see the person raised in the name of Jesus. It says, then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if ye this day 
uh, if we this day be examined for the good deed done to this impotent man by which means he is made whole. The man that is raised up here in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is Peter and John. And here's the thing about them. These men that are raised up in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ endued with the power of the Holy Ghost will not bow to the intimidation of the worldly powers around them. They will be as their Savior who stood in the midst of these enemies of the cross unafraid of their threats that would soon be carried out but stood there with a peace that transcended all the circumstances that surrounded them. And so it was with that same heaven sent peace. That Peter lifts up his voice. Unshakable in its tone. In its conviction. In its strength. And he says why are we on trial? For the good deed done to this impotent man. Why his logic's good isn't it? He says we're here doing good. We have done something wonderful today. Why do you stand against it? Do we not see the same today? I say to you, beloved, there is no other body of people in the world today more charitable, more giving, more understanding, more, more loving than the church of Jesus Christ. And yet there's no more people group in the world persecuted more than the Christians. Isn't that amazing? I tell you as it was in Peter's day, so it is in our day. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked and who can know it? And we see a pervertedness today reigning in our government, reigning in our society that, that has turned its back on the things of God and seeks to silence the church of Jesus Christ and ridicule even the good that is done. Oh, I say to you this morning, beloved, and maybe you think this man's getting kind of radical. I don't know if I am or not. But I'm preaching what God has laid in my heart, I believe. But I tell you this, we need men and women today raised up by the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. We need Sunday school teachers raised up in the Holy Ghost and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need deacons and we need elders today who are raised up in the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ. We need preachers raised up. We need, we need missionaries today. We need our young folk enthused and inspired by God the Holy Spirit. Not inspired by preachers or pastors. My that will be short lived. But young men and women whom God takes a hold of. And their hearts are gripped in the palm of God. And their lives are endued with power and desire and burden. Energized and alive for God. We need that today. And we're sitting in meetings. Nobody's even shouting hallelujah. Nobody's even shouting praise the Lord. Just sit there. Don't drop the boat. Just keep it the way it is. In a mission this last week in Dunsevery, Ivan mission, many unsaved there preached the gospel for a week, not one saved as far as I know. Drove out and drove in without Jesus. How can a preacher go home and lie in his bed? How can he go home and not be disturbed? How can he stand up the next Sunday morning in front of his own people? As though it never concerned him or bothered him. That men and women may be sat in a gospel meeting for the last time. And go to a crisis hell. We need men and women raised up today. But look at something else. Look at the proof realized in the name of Jesus. Verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Peter and John are asked, by what power and in whose name have you done this miracle? And what they were saying to him is this, who has commissioned you to do these things? Who has given you the authority to do these things? Who has given you the power to do these things? 
Oh, Peter's answer must have shocked them to their core. But Peter speaks to them as to all Israel because they, re they represented the Jewish nation. And he says, be in no doubt, be wise. He says, be in no doubt that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh, by the minute they would hear that name. By the thought that we're finished with the carpenter's son. I, I, there were rumors going about that, that, he, that he had been raised from the dead. But, but there were just rumors, they thought. And anyway, they had made up their own rumor just to make sure. But now with the precision of a chief surgeon, Peter thrust the truth right into their poison-filled hearts. He says, the one you falsely accused, the one with lawless hands you crucified. The one whom God the Father raised from the dead and emptied the tomb. It is in his name and in his power that this man stands before you healed and hearty today. Isn't it wonderful that all the glory and all the praise belong to Jesus? Isn't it? Maybe this kangaroo court thought. That these two boys that were ignorant and unlearned were wanting to make a name for themselves. And so they would be easily led into taking the glory for themselves. Say we did it. It was by our words. By our life. By our preaching. That this was done. But Peter is a wise man. And he says all the recognition for what has been done to this man belongs to Jesus. Beloved, we have been given a name. We have been given the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to rest upon, to stand upon, to defeat every power of darkness with, to avail before the throne of God with. Let us not take it in vain by the way we live. Because the strength of our Christian life is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That strength that is seen in his resurrection. <clears throat> seen in the redemption of precious souls. And seen in that all the glory. And all the honor. And all the praise belongs to Jesus. Beloved that's as far as we're going to go this morning. We've seen the strength. The evidence for the strength. Of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have to come back. If you're visiting the us, Well you're going to have to come back next week. To hear the next wee bit about it. As we look again at the boldness of the name of Jesus. Amen. May God bless his word to our hearts and to our souls. Let's just stir our hearts before God in prayer. Father in heaven, we bow before thee this morning. We thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for the power of thy word. And we thank thee, Father, for the straightness of thy word. And we pray, our Father, this morning. That, oh, our Father, that the preacher hasn't stepped outside. But, oh, our Father God, it has been as lusts and lusts set below to our hearts. We pray, our Father, for the people of God here, that we would stand firm on the name of Jesus. We would plead the name of Jesus. We would serve thee in the name of Jesus. And that all the glory and all the honor and all the praise would be his. And so, Father, we pray again that you'll take this wee fellowship. You know all of our weaknesses, our Father. And, Father, you know we haven't much within ourselves to offer. But such as we have, help us to lay it on the altar and to see the things that our God can do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to sing a hymn together before we come to the Lord's table. This hymn brings us to the Lord's table this morning. As I said, you're welcome if you're saved and you're walking in fellowship with the Lord to join with us as we remember the Lord in his own appointed way. But if you have to leave, you can do so as we're singing this hymn. It's 181. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. 181 will stand together as we sing. Thank you so much for coming this morning. And if you're able to get back this evening at 7 o'clock, why, I'd be glad to see you. If you can bring somebody else with you, that would be even better. We want to see souls saved. And so please come back again this evening at 7 o'clock for the gospel meeting. But let's stand together and sing.
Father, again, it's just the hush of these moments falls upon our souls. As we come to the table, we thank thee and we praise thee for the salvation of our souls. Thank thee, our Father, that he took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Father, we just pray your blessing upon us now. In Jesus' precious and lovely name. Amen.